Hi, it is Cody Joe from The New Beautiful Me, and I just wanted to put a quick video out because I went to an antique shop today and found some really cool finds. Also, I'm going to go get a facial today because I have to say no makeup and my skin is feeling really good. Okay, so we'll get through the, uh, where's the really cool thing? Okay, so this is what I was most excited for from the antique shop. Now, this is a stereoscope. So you look through it, and the picture inside of there becomes one image. See? Now, if you remember the viewfinder thingies that you may have had when you were a kid, this is like the Victorian version. This goes up and down, and this one is from 1896. You can even see the, I don't know if it's gonna go, but it has a mark on it, so that's pretty neat. And then the cards are really cool. This card is from, well, I assume the picture's from 1755 because they didn't have the technology then. But what happens is it puts both of the images together and then you just see the one. So, okay, so I got the ballet dancer. And here is the Place de la Comrade in Paris, Francais. Just kidding, I speak terrible French. Uh, le com le Compu à Poule Francais. I understand a little French. Okay, that's a very cool one. And it's neat that this one's in color too. And so you just like slide them in and then you look through it. No, no, you won't be able to see it very well, but see, it's kind of cool, kind of cool. So, okay, I'll show you the other pictures I got. Down. Okay, and so we have the Prudential and Telephone Buildings in Buffalo, New York, and. Central Park, New York Museum. Now, I'm from Denver, so I had to get this one. It's the Broadway Theater and Hotel Metropolis in Denver. This one's pretty. This one is an inner court in an Alps village. And see, on the back, it says, one of the peculiar customs of the Tyrolians the shoe platter dance was shown in a singular impressive way at the Tyrolean Alps, Alps concession at exposition. The dance begins like any other round dance, but soon the lad separates from the lass and commences a series of capers and jumps, gyrations and gymnastic evolutions, displaying wonderful agility, quiet unlooked for this heavy, solidly knit frame. All these evolutions are accompanied by a loud, shrill, whistling and smacking imitation of antics of love sick, capricolis or black cock, and by sounding slaps of muscular thighs and soles of shoes, and by ferocious stamping on the ground. The last, meanwhile, holding her short but ample skirts with both hands, continues to dance in a circular motion around him until he is through with his antics when she rewards him with a kiss. Quite the story for the little card, huh? And this one's me. Daniel O'Connell statue, Seekville Street in Dublin, Ireland. Now, O'Connell is the most magical name in Ireland, next to St. Patrick's own. The Liberator was born in 1775, and died in 1847 at Giona on a pilgrimage to Rome. He was educated in France and received such impressions of the horrors of French Revolution that his agitation for Irish liberty kept so far from violence or any semblance to the wild hysterics of the Celt, which had made Paris run with blood, and he was reproached with being a peace at any price man. He seemed to realize that his eloquent, peaceful agitation in parliament and on the platform before vast multitudes of his countrymen 
would fall short of his purpose. When I am dead, he said, another generation with redder blood in its veins will arise to burst the chains of my country. His magnificent monument bears his own statue, the fully 12 foot high on a circular drum surrounded by 50 figures of which the chief is Aaron casting off her father's or off her fetters, sorry, holding, this is kind of hard to read on the back, <clears throat> holding the act of emancipation in one hand and the other un uplifted to the liberator. At the corners of the pedestal are figures of patriotism, faith, eloquence, and courage. That's really cool. Okay, I love, 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 love this one. So this is people looking at Matterhorn from Raffelberg Hotel in Switzerland. Now I love this one because I love like the chairs and the umbrellas and just how the people were. <clears throat> of the Matterhorn, David Starr Jordan says, no one who has ever seen it can ever forget its form. It burns itself into the memory as nothing else in all Europe does. Shut your eyes for a moment. You have been at Zermatt and straight above you, or straight before you and above you, is its long hand clutching at the sky, you will see the Matterhorn. It's not the highest mountain in the Alps. Its gigantic neighbors, Monte Rosa and Michel Bohorn, the Weisenhor, as well as Mont Blanc, are all higher a little, but no other mountain in the world makes such use of its height as Matterhorn. <coughs> Excuse me. Other high mountains have great rounded heads, white with snows of eternity. Their harsher angles are worn away by long action of glaciers, but the Matterhorn is a creature of the sun and frost. No glacier has worn its angles into curves. Its slopes are too steep for snow to cling to. And all the snow which falls upon it rolls down its sides and lies in the three great ice heaps at the bottom. This terrible peak, over 14,000 feet in height, was first ascended on July 14, 1865 by Wimper Hudson, Hadway, and Lord Francis Douglas with their two guides, Michelle Crows and the two Tugwalders. Near the top of the descent, Hadwo slipped and, and precipitated the rest, except Wimper and the Tugwalders 4,000 feet toward the Matterhorn Glacier. In 1898, an electric railway was opened at the point, uh, or to view, uh, in 1898, an electric railway was opened to our viewpoint at Hotel Reifelberg. Off to the north in Switzerland, the Bernese Alps were many glaciers, the lowest being Grindelwald. And this one is, this card is copyright. I cannot read it. I can't read the copyright data. Unless you can. Can't make it out. Okay, I'll do that. Okay, and then this card is Pickers at Work in an Oregon Hop Field. I just thought that was neat. In Oregon, the harvesting of hops begins at the end of August and continues four weeks. The work must be prosecuted with all speed, a large force of pickers being engaged for this purpose, or the hops will turn red and dry on the vines. The picker is provided with a knife, a sack, and a basket, or other reciprocal to hold hops. Indian pickers prefer a cloth spread on the ground. Each picker takes a row of hops. The vine is cut with a knife two or three feet from the ground and is jerked parallel with the wire to which the, to which the string which supports the vine is tied off at the top of a trellis. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm pulling a little sick, <laughs> as you can tell. Each picker takes a row of hops of vine. Okay. The jerk brings the string. <laughs> it's funny that the jerk was actually a person. <laughs> the jerk brings the string and the vine down together. The picker removes the hops as rapidly as possible. 
Small leaves no longer, no larger than a thumbnail are taken indifferently, but larger leaves must be rejected. Hops must not be pressed down in the sack or basket. Pressing hinders the hot air of passing through them in the kiln. And even while the sack pressed the hops, or even while in the sack, pressed hops may begin to heat and turn black. And this card is a copyrighted 1905 by Keystone View Company. And then my last card is definitely the most unique. Um, it doesn't have anything on the back, but it, okay, in 3D, this is a depiction of Jesus Christ being taken uh, when he had to carry his cross and the Roman soldiers were like, get up there. And in 3D, this is a weird picture and very cool. I had to get it. Okay, so... First treasure was the view scope, view scope and cards. Ooh, you can also get risque cards. Like the lady at the shop told me, it's totally gonna get Victorian porn. Totally gonna get Victorian porn. Okay, so next up, ooh, okay. Christian Dior 1970s glasses. These are freaking fantastic. I, okay, they are prescription, so I need to get new lenses for them, but they were originally like 70 bucks, this shop's closing, 50% off. How can I not do like 30, 35 bucks for uh, vintage Dior glasses? Heck yeah. See? Now, I mean, these are just so freaking 70s retro and awesome. Like, just the most awesome thing ever. <laughs> okay. Chua. Chua. No idea what chua is, but it's something. Okay. Next thing. The lady is a very good upseller <laughs> at the store. They're closing. So she, I have, uh, I had my gauges in when I was in there. And she brought all of these gauge earrings. Now, these are normally, they were charging for vintage gauges. They're charging about $13 a piece for them. Or not 13. What did I say 13 a piece for them? That's not even a thing. Um, 35 and she sold me uh, four pairs for 20 bucks. So these ones are eight gauges and the eight gauges fit me. Let's see, Let's see how freaking cool. Oh, ah, had them in. There we go. See how cool are these? I love these earrings. Those are just cool. Oh, okay, and then the other gauges. These ones. And these ones are eight gauge also. These ones are cool. These ones are six gauges and these ones are wood. Okay, and then, so those ones are six, and then, oh, we have these four good ones, too. Let me take these out so I can see what these look like. And those are pretty cool, too. But hey, for five bucks a pair for vintage gauges, lady knew I couldn't resist. Okay. And last on earrings are, these are so fun. You have a knife and a fork. <laughs> Let's try these ones on. Oh god, these are heavy. <laughs> of course, because they're freaking silverware. I love the bead on the end of them too. The bead is fantastic. Okay. I mean, of course, I'd take a half of them. <laughs> Those are just silly. I love them. Okay, now. We're getting to my childhood. Now, this is the last thing is strawberry shortcake. Like a real vintage strawberry shortcake doll. I love strawberry shortcake when I was a kid. Yay. So, okay. This was my score from the vintage shop. Yeah.